It's good to be back at the chaplaincy after my various travels. Um, as you know, we had a wonderful wedding in Poland with Alla and Michal. So just a great celebration and for you to pray for them um, and also to pray for John and Therese. Uh, John worked here as an assistant chaplain three years ago and he was married, they were married yesterday. Um, so just lots of prayer and lots of thanksgiving. I've started rereading this week um, one of my favourite books. So there it is, if you want some spiritual reading. The Art of Prayer, subtitle An Orthodox Anthology. And this is a compilation of spiritual texts, texts from the Orthodox tradition, edited by Igumen Chariton of Valmoa. If you haven't heard of him, you can look him up. I've read it wrong. Valamo. Igumen Chariton of Valamo. I've read this many times and I kind of come back to it when I need some spiritual nourishment. I guess I'm feeling that in the, the, the busyness and the heat of the summer. I remembered, as in my memory of the book, was all the deep mystical stuff. But I've forgotten how practical and earthy it is. And in fact, the first article by someone called Dmitri of Rostov is called The Inner Closet of the Heart, so it sounds very deep and spiritual and mystical. But the first passages in the first article are all about how the external practices of our faith need to fit together with the inner personal journey that we're on. And that we need both absolutely. This is the message. So it's not just deep mysticism, it's very practical, earthy religion. We need, says Dimitri, an external rhythm. We need a way of life. We need traditions and customs and prayers and coming to church. The message in the book that religion is doable, and you know that the word religion comes from the root to bind, to connect us with something. So part of the message of the beginning of the book is don't get too mystical or too sentimental. Religion is something solid. And this reminded me, reading this yesterday, of the first time I went to visit um, a monastery properly was, was to go and visit the wonderful Benedictine Monastery of Belmont uh, in the West Country because my chaplain was a Benedictine monk from there. And I was, I was 19, I was seeking deep mystical experiences, you know the way it is. And I got there and the abbot said to me, he kind of looked, he'd seen all this before, and he said to me, you know what this monastery is about, Stephen, don't you? I said, tell me. He said, this is just about working men doing our prayers. The Benedictine tradition. This is about working men doing our prayers. Very unromantic, but very profound, actually. And, this is the rest of the book, yes, we need the inner journey. We need the heart and the depths. And we need this to be personal and not just external. There are things to do, but if all we're doing is doing, something fundamental is missing. The heart, the, the inner person. Me. So there is all this in my mind. And then coming to the scriptures with all this in my mind, just the wonderful balance that the scriptures give us today of exactly this question. Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, he's delighted as he speaks to his people. Here, God has given us the book of the law. Here it is. And just for us to get rid of all our prejudices about law and legalism and, and impositions and I've got to do this. Moses is so delighted and excited that this God who was so distant and unknown and, and impossible to come face to face with, so, so deep and dark and mysterious and so other, this God has given to his people the book of the law so that we can know him and share in his wisdom and knowledge in our words and our language in a, in a physical book, a scroll here it is on this table, on this altar on this, in this community before us something we can touch and read and follow and put into practice 
And this lovely poetry that Moses uses, he says, this law is not something in heaven beyond our reach. It's not something across the far seas that we cannot travel to. The law of God, his wisdom and his words are right here with us. What a gift. And yes, the last line of Deuteronomy today, this needs to be taken into our heart for our obedience. That's the language. The gift of the law, of God's wisdom and love, that's there objectively before us, for us to touch and take hold on. But then, the, the spiritual work, the moral, the mystical work of taking this into our hearts and making <coughs> it personal. This is practical mysticism. And you see how what Moses says, of course we can see this as Christians, is a prefigurement of the Incarnation. Yeah. That that God is not just up there in the heavens beyond our reach. He's spoken to us through the law, through his word, and we can see as Christians, the word is not just a book, but the living word of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, took flesh and lived among us. As St. Paul says in the Colossians today, that Christ is the image of the unseen God. Christ is the word the law that we can touch and talk to in flesh, not just on paper or parchment. The same message actually is hidden in the Gospel, although you might not notice it because you jump ahead to the story of the Good Samaritan. I say to you, what Gospel did we hear today? You say to me, I hope, the story of the Good Samaritan. But it's only the second half. It's only the second half. Because the full gospel that we heard today, the lawyer asks Jesus a question. Do you notice lawyer, law? The question is, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You can rephrase that in a hundred ways. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to see God and know God and be with him forever? And the first answer that Jesus gives is not to tell the story of the Good Samaritan, is it? The first answer Jesus gives is, tell me what is written in the law. Jesus, the Word made flesh, when he's asked about eternal life, he directs the inquirer to the book of the law. Never say that Jesus came to tear up the law or the Old Testament. He didn't. He came to fulfil it and to point towards it and towards its deepest, truest meaning. And the lawyer is a good lawyer. He knows the law, the book of the law. And he says to Jesus in reply, to inherit eternal life, this is what we must do. We must love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind. And we must love our neighbour as ourself. That is the law. That is the gospel. Do you see, it's not legalism. It's the law of the heart. Moses, the book of the law, Jesus, leading us to the deepest meaning of the law, which is to love God and to love our neighbour with our whole being. That's the first answer. We're going to come to the story, but don't just jump to stories as if all Jesus does is tell stories. He embodies and points towards and explains the law in this deep, rich sense. Something that we must do to put into practice religion, remember, is something that binds. That's not a threat, that's a gift, a promise. And then he tells the story. Okay, we've got to talk about the Good Samaritan a little, a little bit. What is it for this, this incredible law of love to be embodied in an example in a, in a real situation, which is how we have to live it every day. Well, you've heard this many times, but just notice the, the beautiful steps of love that the Samaritan goes on. It's not just, what did the Good Samaritan do? Oh, he loved his neighbour. He went on a journey of charity, going deeper and deeper into the, the meaning of the law and the meaning of love. I'm not going to explain all this. I'm just going to hop through it. Look at the steps. First, he was moved with compassion. 
Just please think of yourself as I'm, as I'm saying these words. How does this apply to you, to me? He let his heart be moved. Notice my language. You might say, oh, but sometimes I'm not moved with compassion. Well, that's true. But are you not moved because you didn't let your heart be moved? Being moved is not just a passive reaction or an emotion. It's something we allow ourselves. Compassion is partly an act of the will. And if my heart is closed to being moved with compassion, I will never be moved with compassion. So this man allows himself to be moved with compassion. And then he moves. I'm not just being clever. This is the gospel. This is the Greek. He went. How often have you, have I, been moved with compassion, but not moved any further? I'm feeling very moved and I'm not doing anything. I'm not going anywhere. Well, this man was moved and then he moved himself. He crossed the road. He went to the, to the man who was so wounded and, and damaged. And then he became very practical. He didn't just turn up. He bandaged his wounds he salved his wounds, he dressed them, he used the equipment and the skills he had, he got his hands dirty. Is this you in your love for your neighbour and me? And then, this is lovely, he lifted him onto his own mount, it says in our translation. He put him on his horse or on his donkey. Do you notice the symbolism of this? He puts the wounded man into his place. It's his donkey. It's his seat, his saddle. And he's not sitting in it anymore. But this stranger is. We're going really deep now in, in, in the meaning of charity. It's not just me here to help someone over there. It's me to allow this person to take my place. And to me, for me to go into their place. Do you see the links with Jesus in his compassion and Jesus on the cross? It's the deepest meaning of loving our neighbour as ourself. Then he takes him to the inn. This is not just temporary. This is not just a spontaneous virtue signalling signaling one hour of compassion so that I can say I've been compassionate and everyone can see it. He goes to the inn, he continues to care for him, he gives the innkeeper money so that the, the care can continue, he's going to come back and make good. It doesn't stop. We don't put limits round charity. We don't know what the cost will be. He doesn't know what the final bill will be. Is he going to order steak and chips while he's away that evening? He doesn't know. Beautiful, beautiful story of the deepening of charity and compassion. And for you to take the, the newsletter home with you, to, to read it on your own Bibles, you've got the reference there. And as I say, it's not for me to explain the whole of the story, it's, it's too deep for one sermon. But to see the stages of love, and you almost to take one word at a time and think, how can I embody this in my life? The last phrase I want to talk about it's just the, the discussion at the end. Jesus says, in, in our translation here from the Jerusalem Bible, which of these three proved himself to be a neighbour? Proved himself. And in fact, the, the Greek is something slightly difficult to translate. It's which of these three seemed to become a neighbour? to the other. Can you hear that? Seemed to become a neighbour. In other words, it's not a static verb. That's the important thing. It's not which of these three was his neighbour. It's which of these three became, with an echo of what I was saying earlier, allowed himself to become, was willing to become. And that's the final challenge of the Gospel. If you leave here, and when you're thinking about the meaning of Christian love, and when you're thinking about fulfilling the law, if the only question you have in mind is, who is my neighbour? 
you will have failed. I will have failed. Because I'm asking a static question, as if I've got to look around and categorise who's my neighbour, who isn't, and those who aren't I can ignore and leave them to someone else. Do you see the challenge? The challenge is, who is God asking me to become a neighbour to? Or who out there needs to become my neighbour? And I haven't allowed them to be my neighbour up to this point. And then when I recognise that they are, can I go on this incredible journey of love that the Samaritan went on to actually love my neighbour? What is love? Who is my neighbour? Who could become my neighbour if only I noticed them and allowed it? And having become my neighbour, how could I truly love them as this Samaritan as Christ. That's the meaning of the law and the prophets and the gospel.